The first chapter of our textbook introduces the concept of intercultural communication and talks about why in today's world it's needed. Before we get started with this first presentation, I want to point out a couple of things. First, I'm going to go, be going through these presentations fairly rapidly, and you can pause um, the presentation at any point, go forwards and backwards. Second, I'm not going to be talking in detail um, about the chapter or even necessarily covering everything that's discussed in the chapter. I'm going to be trying to point out the more important aspects of what's introduced in the chapter, trying to add details when I feel that's necessary, give examples, try to clarify some points that are raised and, and, and go beyond, in some cases, what's presented in the textbook, updates, statistics, and so forth. <clears throat> Third, there are other resources that are available for you for working with the textbook. Um, in Blackboard you'll find chapter summaries. Also in Blackboard there's a link to the publisher website for this textbook which um, has additional information, resources, and tools. We can approach intercultural communication from a variety of perspectives. This would be one to look at the diversity of the world today and looking at it from the, the perspective of an American. Um, Americans represent about four and a half percent of the world population. So if we want to communicate with people outside uh, our own country, there's a wide world out there that's getting larger, getting more diverse. The, textbook points out that there are two countries that represent about 40 percent of the world's population today, uh, China and India. There's a lot of interest these days in the United States of, uh, for learning uh, Chinese, for learning Mandarin Chinese. That didn't used to be the case, but China is becoming increasingly important uh, demographically, but uh, also uh, in terms of uh, the economy of the United States. Um, the United States uh, is not alone in the world, um, and that's increasingly the case. The world is a diverse place, not only in terms of nationalities, but obviously in terms of religion, in terms of language, in terms of culture. Those are all things we're going to be talking about in this course. One of the things that's bringing the world together is technology. Technology trends in recent years have made communication much easier, communication not just um, with um, people from one's own country, but across the world. Um, so this, this notion of a global village is becoming a reality. But technology is not um, the same uh, in all countries in terms of availability of internet, availability of, of modern communication. Um, the internet um, has shown considerable growth, but it's not out there in all countries, and it varies significantly. Um, in Western Europe, uh, internet access is over 60%. In, um, in African countries, it's in the single digits, uh, typically. Cell phone usage is much more widespread, um, and in, um, in a lot of countries, it's near 100%. That's the case in, in Western Europe. It's the case in the United States. Um, even in countries that where internet access is not as widespread, you have widespread cell phone usage. Uh, so for example, in African countries, uh, in India as well. One of the difficulties in providing internet access is the lack of an infrastructure in uh, developing countries. Um, another problem is illiteracy. So to use a cell phone, you don't necessarily um, have to have a high level of literacy, um, but this is, is, is something that, that is changing um, uh, very rapidly in terms of, of, of literacy growth, in terms of cell phone uh, usage, in terms of internet access. We're seeing that that's certainly going to be a trend that's going to continue. In terms of communication, how we communicate through technology, it uh, used to be that the main way that um, that that happened on the internet was through email. Increasingly, that's happening through social networking services. Facebook is 
popular not just in the United States. 70% of Facebook users are outside the U.S. Twitter uh, also is a worldwide phenomenon, played an important part, for example, in 2011 in the Arab Spring, it allowed people to uh, organize and communicate um, in Tunisia, in, um, Egypt, uh, for example. Um, one of the interesting, to me, uh, aspects of uh, the internationalization of communication is what's happening with multiplayer online gaming like the World World of Warcraft um, that uh, players in the United States are, are routinely connecting with players throughout the world and there are uh, chats going on all the time uh, not just in English but in other languages and the internet is not an English only environment um, English is um, is still the leading language, but um, Chinese is not far behind. In fact, if you look at the top languages used on the internet today, the Chinese um, uh, is behind English, and then comes Spanish, Japanese, Portuguese, German, and Arabic. Um, and we're, we're seeing English, in fact, uh, in terms of use on the internet, uh, English is declining um, in, in, um, in percentage. If we talk about why intercultural communication um, is important, um, we can look at that from a variety of perspectives. And, and, and one is, of course, uh, from a national, international perspective, we've seen a lot of conflict that has arisen in recent years uh, due to intolerance of other uh, groups. Uh, we've seen that, for example, in African countries, in Nigeria and Sudan, where you have inter-ethnic uh, conflict, um, sometimes that's that's been a very result in very serious um, conflicts. Indeed, um, in uh, in the case of uh, Rwanda, for example, um, <clears throat> but we're seeing it not only those ethnic um, conflicts, not only um, in Africa um, and other continents. We're seeing that um, in Western Europe uh, as well. If you take the example of Germany, you have a large uh, Turkish immigrant population that came to Germany in the 1950s and 60s as so-called Gastarbeiter, uh, guest workers, um, and who've stayed on. And um, a number of these immigrant fa Turkish immigrant families live in, in large cities in Germany and stay among themselves. <coughs> And um, particularly among older Turkish uh, immigrants, um, many of them don't speak German very well or sometimes not at all. Uh, those uh, Turkish immigrants typically are not Christians, they're Muslims. Uh, Germany is a predominantly Christian country. This has caused some conflict in a variety of ways in Germany. Same is true in France with the Maghreb um, countries, the immigration from the Maghreb countries. Those are the countries of northern uh, Africa, there used to be French colonies, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia. Um, a lot of the young people from those countries have come to France looking for work, and typically they, they speak some French. Um, but there again, they have a different culture, they have a different religion, and there have been serious problems of integration um, among the, the, those populations. And these issues with um, ethnic minorities <clears throat> striving for recognition and, and in, some, in some cases independence is, is something that we're seeing throughout the world. Tibet, for example, in China, um, even in Great Britain, uh, there's a independence movement in Scotland. There's going to be a, a, a vote, in fact, in a couple of years for uh, Scottish independence. In our own country, um, we're seeing that as well. We're seeing this kind of apprehension um, fear over minority groups that has led to things like the Brown County Diversity Resolution, which brought reference to Brown County, Wisconsin. This resolution, in fact, is the opposite of diversity. It calls for uh, English as the official language. It's not that in Brown County, Wisconsin, um, that it was likely that the whole population was suddenly going to start speaking uh, Mandarin Chinese or Swahili. Uh, it's no doubt that English is the dominant language and will, be, and will remain the dominant language in, in this county. But um, there's an uh, increasing population um, of Hispanics, and there's a minority Hmong population as well. 
And what this resolution really did, and this is not picking necessarily on Brown County, this has happened in other places in the United States as well, but what this resolution really did, the effect of it was to indicate to those minority groups that um, they better be melted into the melting pot of the United States, that is to say that um, they better adapt to the dominant culture. And if they didn't, uh, they were going to be less than welcome um, in Brown County. This is not, um, as I say, something that's unique to Wisconsin. Um, this idea of a melting pot is something that um, a lot of Americans still cling to. Uh, fortunately, there's also um, a trend that goes in the opposite direction. Um, if you think about a melting pot, what happens in a melting pot? Well, <clears throat> the individual flavors go away. Um, so the idea there, uh, uh, ethnically, uh, culturally, of uh, the United States is a melting pot, you lose your cultural heritage. It gets merged into the dominant flavor, if you will. Um, as I say, that's a trend that um, that is not universal in the United States. There's a lot of interest now and recognition of the importance of keeping your cultural heritage and keeping your your language if you have if you grow up speaking a lang another language. It used to be that um, if you grew in, up in a minority um, a, a, a family from a minority culture um, that uh, you weren't encouraged to learn that language. That fortunately is is no longer the case. It's a big advantage to be able to speak more than one language and to have that that cultural uh, heritage is important on a personal basis as well and so it's not something that that should be given up it's something that should be preserved obviously it's important to be able to function in the dominant culture as well so learning english if you live in the united states is a is a imperative you have to do it if you if you're going to um, be able to to live in this country and 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 find a good job <clears throat> Just to point out um, an, an, a, an example of, of that importance of, of keeping your, your cultural heritage alive, uh, we have a number of international partnerships at VCU. And a couple of years ago, we started partnerships with two universities in India. And as an outgrowth of that partnership, we started offering Hindi language um, instruction at VCU. And um, I visited a Hindi 101 class. I was, at the time, I was the administrator in world studies in charge of, of language instruction. And I was surprised when I walked into the classroom of this Hindi 101 class, because all the students looked like they were Indians. And I was wondering, do these students um, already speak Hindi? Uh, I was afraid it was going to be a similar situation to the problems that we've had with uh, native Arabic speakers trying to take Arabic 101 or native Mandarin speakers trying to uh, sign up for Chinese uh, 101. But in talking to the students, I discovered that they were second and third generation Indians. They didn't speak Hindi. Um, they didn't grow up speaking the language at home. They wanted to learn Hindi as part of their own cultural heritage. And I think this is fortunately something that's that, that we're seeing uh, uh, increasingly in the United States. The United States is becoming an increasingly diverse place. In the year 2000, European Americans constituted 70% of the population of this country. In the most recent census, 2010, down to 65%. Projection for mid-century is that uh, Americans of European American descent will be barely, <laughs> if at all, um, in the majority. We're seeing increases in Hispanic population, in particular 15% in the most recent census, projected to increase to about a quarter of the population, increases as well in the African American population, um, substantial increase, increase in the Asian American population, the United States becoming a more diverse place, so you don't have to venture outside <coughs> of the borders of this country to experience cultural diversity. Why is it important? Well, uh, healthier communities can arise from uh, the recognition that we need to be tolerant um, of other cultures, we need to understand other cultures, we, understand, we need to understand their point of view. And that's true not only locally, but it's true nationally as well. Um, we're seeing in a number of countries in Western Europe, in Japan, 
in Russia a decline in the birth rate. Well, how can that be? Um, uh, how can that be helped? Well, one way is through immigration, but it's only going to work if you accept those immigrants if they're uh, ex they're accepted into that mainstream culture. Increased commerce, we'll be talking about that later. It's obviously important if you're trying to sell something uh, to in another country that you understand that culture, that you understand um, something about cultural practices, business practices, um, maybe I have the basics of the language. Reduce conflict, obviously this is important at a national, international level. It's important uh, at an individual level as well. I uh, have this horrendous example of, of what happened due to intolerance in Norway in 2011 with Anders Breivik um, killing over 70 people as a statement he said against multiculturalism in Norway. He didn't want the immigrants there and this was a way of, of drawing attention to that fact. Personal growth, we want to encourage tolerance um, and we want to encourage the ability to see other points of view. That's an important part of be, being a mature person. Um, it's often pointed out that learning a second language well uh, creates for yourself a second you, a second self. We'll be talking about that uh, a little bit more. It's particularly important that we have leaders who understand the importance of tolerance, who understand other points of view. We've unfortunately seen in recent years the growth of political parties that move in the opposite direction, anti-immigration parties in France, for example, the Front National, um, which in the most recent uh, presidential election in France got 18 percent of the vote in the first round of, of voting. We're seeing parties even in Scandinavia. Scandinavia we think of as a very tolerant place, a tolerant set of countries, tolerant culture, but uh, there we have, have political parties like the True Finns in Finland, very uh, vehemently anti-immigrant uh, um, party. Uh, the same is true in Norway and Sweden. There are similar parties, the so-called Freedom Party that An Anders Breivik uh, was part of for, for a while, um, the Sweden Democrats. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, really a concern because these, these parties um, can come into, can um, not only um, come into the uh, parliaments but uh, also can move uh, uh, elected politicians that have to be elected, move them away from tolerance. Um, so that's one of the things that we, we saw, for example, in the French presidential election in, in 2012, is that uh, uh, because of uh, the desire to, to get those voters who voted for the Front National, uh, the uh, leader of the um, right uh, coalition, who was Nicol uh, Nicolas uh, Sarkozy, um, really started pandering to the to the uh, to those far right that far right constituency. One of the outcomes I'm hoping from this course um, will be that through learning about other cultures and how to communicate in other cultures that um, students will gain some insight into their own culture and their own means of communication and be more mindful of how communication takes place and what the context is uh, for communicating with people from other cultures. Communication is a dynamic process in a, it's always changing, um, it's not static, it's interactive, and it takes more than one person to communicate. It's symbolic, we'll be talking about that when we talk about verbal, nonverbal language. Um, it's intentional most of the time, um, not necessarily always. If you're talking to somebody and you yawn, you're sending probably a message that's not intended. 
it's contextual. Um, we'll talking be talking about that a lot um, in this course. Ubiquitous. Um, that's what it means to be human. Is unless you live as a hermit in the woods, um, you're going to be doing a lot of communicating. And cultural, obviously, it's going to be major, one of the major um, focal points of this course, the cultural aspect of, of communication. Communication is a complex process. We don't think about it. We do it automatically. But actually, what's involved is um, encoding and decoding at the same time. That is to say, we're receiving messages, we're figuring out what those messages mean, and we're, we're getting not, those messages not only from words, from the verbal system of communication, but also from nonverbal, from, from facial expressions, from hand gestures, from, uh, from how close a person is standing to you, or maybe the person's moving away. Um, there is a lot going on uh, when we communicate, and so we're going to be talking about that uh, quite a bit. Uh, and the process can be anxiety provoking um, and um, this is true not only when we're dealing with people from different cultures it can can happen to all of us it might be something that's that's inborn it might be a personality trait we might be very shy uh, outside of our immediate family or our circle of friends but it could be context-based um, it could be that you have no problem speaking with friends but um, speaking with um, uh, a professor, for example, uh, you might not feel quite as comfortable. Um, Audience-based, a lot of people have anxiety um, in terms of public speaking. It's not, not uncommon at all. It could be situational. could be based on uh, both the audience and the context. And I think we'll stop um, the presentation for this chapter at this point. We'll continue with the uh, second part, starting to talk then about culture.